visit friends. I would cross the Texas border to visit friends that lived in Reynosa. Um, it is a great pleasure to be uh, here in your beautiful country and visit you in Guadalajara. Before I get started, I, I'd like to see a, a show of hands. How many of you are working on a product that you think maybe you'd like to show people or take to market? Anything at all? How many of you have an idea that you think you might like to turn into a product? Okay, how many of you have heard the terms big data or machine learning? Okay, more of those. All right, so we're going to cover stuff within those, those areas. I want to address really two things. One has been our technological journey with Right Lab, um, what we've achieved, what we've pivoted with, what kinds of technological pitfalls uh, have motivated uh, the current state of the product. And the second is where I think artificial intelligence is right now um, and where it's going. So to give you some context, uh, this is about three years ago. I was teaching at UC Berkeley um, and I was working with a lot of students who were writing. There were second language learners, there were native speakers, just a huge variety. Uh, a lot of students from Asia as well. And I had been writing for a while, and I had been helping students when I was in college uh, to revise their medical school applications, to revise their graduate school applications. But what I saw when I was actually teaching was something quite different. And that was that I would get a batch of papers, and I would need to grade those papers and give them back to students. And it took me roughly around two weeks to do this by which time the students already had a grade on those papers and they weren't interested in taking any of the feedback I had left them because they were motivated by another assignment. Now, how many of you has had to write something and mostly did it at the last minute? Okay, that's like everybody. Um, now, there are many reasons for doing that, right? Like you have other courses, you have to decide which among my courses am I gonna throw under the bus. Maybe if I do a little bit less work on this one, I can still pass the class while privileging another course, things like that. But the point here was, I was leaving feedback in vain. It wasn't going anywhere. And students were not practicing frequently enough to really develop a skill. One of the things that I do, and I do it almost every day because it requires that much practice, is dance. It helps me relieve stress as an entrepreneur, but I have to do it almost every day. It's the same thing with writing. It's the same thing with programming. If you're going to do it, you need to do it frequently. To develop enough confidence, to develop enough expertise with the skill, you have to do it frequently. So I thought, okay, well, what's, what's going on here? How can I do something about this workflow that is greatly inefficient? At the same time, I happened to be taking courses in the School of Information Science. I had been working with some of the latest technologies in natural language processing. And what I saw were there were a lot of patterns among the feedback that was really repetitive that I could automate. And so I started playing around with it. And one of the first things I did was give my students back papers that had been completely machine commented on. So I didn't touch those papers, I just ran it through my system and I gave them feedback. And my students said, wow, I've never received so much feedback before and you seem to be emphasizing certain issues here. I, you know, what can I do about this? And what I realized then was that there was an opportunity to really give students enough value to help them practice to the point of being confident. Now, what the user experience for that would look like has varied over time, and particularly when you're dealing with artificially intelligent systems, when you're dealing with natural language, user experience is everything. If any of you has ever used a chat bot or tried a product like that, you'll see that very quickly it can seem to be fake or it, it just rubs you the wrong way. So with these kinds of products in particular, user experience is everything. But to get user experience right, you have to get the technology right, which is one of the reasons that so few products within artificial intelligence, within natural language processing, have really gone to market and made it at scale. Now, of course, I wanted my students to become more confident. Of course, I wanted to help them. But there was a bigger motivation for me. And one of those, I'm really glad that Guy mentioned Donald Trump because 
and this is actually a piece in there of, of Donald Trump's, one of his speeches, one of the things that was motivating me greatly was all of the bullshit that's out there in language. Um, stuff way beyond grammar, stuff that has to do with how accountable you are for what you're actually saying. So that if a politician, after some catastrophe, um, something that that politician was responsible for, if that politician says something like, regrettably, these things were done, what they don't have the balls to say is, I regret that I did these things. And there's no grammar checker out there that's going to give you, take you from the first one of those to the second one of those. That's the kind of system we wanted to build. Something that was going to drive much greater accountability, something that was going to have people be responsible for the kinds of things that they say and write, something that was going to assess the logic of what they were saying, what kinds of biases they might be using, all of those things we wanted to bring to the fore for people. Now, to build this was not technologically easy. And we knew immediately, okay, this is a natural language processing system. We're right there in Silicon Valley. We're in Berkeley. We have one of the best natural language processing groups in the world. What do we immediately think of? Big data. Okay, let's use big data and solve this problem. Now, I know this problem inside out, at least from a human greater standpoint. So maybe we can build something to solve this problem. Well, there are really two things you need to consider when you're building any kind of an artificially intelligent system. The first is your data set. Is your data set sufficient for your task? Now, a lot of people think, okay, well, the data's really big, so that's fine, right? The bigger it is, the more sufficient it is. The second is you need to run methods over that data. Now, a lot of people, assuming that if the data's big enough, you can just go straight to the methods, go straight to the methods. Now, what do these things look like? These are like open source tools. Um, these are things that you might find in uh, Google's toolkit. You may find these in Google Ngrams. You may find these um, Stanford's got Stanford Core NLP. Lots of systems that you can use to immediately begin developing stuff that at a hackathon you could quickly use to put together an artificially intelligent system. So what we did, first thing was, okay, let's use these methods Let's detect some of these problems that we're finding all the time, and then let's, fee let's leave feedback on these student papers. So we built that. So we had a system that was generating mostly comments for students on their writing. Here's what we found. Teachers loved that, and students did not love that. Why did students not love that? Because even in the case that actual teachers were leaving feedback on their writing, they still weren't paying attention to that. Now, we thought, well, let's just give it to them immediately. They can get this feedback that they would get from a teacher at 2 a.m., and that's actually the problem. Time is the problem. Well, we listened to our users. We tested with them. We went through lots of focus groups. And what we found is, yeah, it's great that we have these comments, but can we actually get some of the answers? Um, if not all of the answers. And so we thought, okay, we're in this educational dilemma, which is, can we give students the answers? We know we can do it technologically. Will the teachers like us less? So we started testing that. And what we found was, as we started to provide revisions for students, actually rewrite sentences, sections of their writing, the teacher retention stayed the same while our student retention went up. And that was primarily because a lot of these issues that were beyond grammar, we thought were going to be too much encroaching on the teacher's territory. But actually, the teacher saw them as really low-level issues, and they didn't want to deal with those anyway. So we moved to that. But now that we had this larger user experience demand, we had to make changes within our technology. Now, almost all artificial intelligence systems are based on detecting different features, right? You throw in some data, you throw in a lot of different variables, and you say, okay, computer, you need to look at this data with respect to these variables, and you need to tell me, you need to classify this as one of several categories or maybe one of only two categories. This is the way all recommendation systems are built. This is the way Netflix is built. This is the way Amazon's product recommendations are built. It is an entirely different thing to say, give me something 
And then I'm not going to make classifications about it. I am going to turn that into something entirely new. So what we needed to shift to was going from a classification system to a translation system. And Guy talked a little bit about going to the next curve. I genuinely believe that machine translation is on the next curve. It is a ne the new wave of products that will come out. One of the reasons for this is that it doesn't require that you simply give it a couple of different categories to choose from. What it's saying is, you give me what is the original and what are your desired outputs, and then I, as the computer, will infer all of the different operations that need to be done in order to go from the first one to the second one. So right now, people use machine translation almost entirely for language. We're using it for language. We say, okay, here's your poor writing, then we give you back better writing. That's what WriteLab does. We do this primarily by moving towards much stronger language, much clearer language, high, language that has a lot of agency in it. But it need not stay within the domain of language. You could easily take this to other domains. You could take it to healthcare. You could take it to organizational structure of teams. If you know what your original is, your poor state, your unhealthy state, your dysfunctional state, and you know what the better state is, you can feed those two things in, and the system will infer what are the operations necessary to go from one to the other. So it's a very powerful paradigm. Very few people use it because so far it's been mostly in an academic domain. It's been locked up in places like Berkeley. There are very few open source kits for it available. But for those of you that would like to build really new, interesting machine learning systems, the first thing I would say to you is, don't trust a slogan like big data. Make sure that the data is sufficient for your task. Now, in Silicon Valley, people only want to invest in things that you can build quickly and you can build cheaply. That's fine. That doesn't mean, OK, let me plug in these open source kits. Let me build what everybody else is building based on the limited functionality of open source tools. And then let me show that to investors. What you can do and what has become increasingly popular as a start to entrepreneurship is, let me pretend to have built it. Let me generate some output, however I do this. And let me see, do people want it? Can I validate this product with an actual market? Because what's going to happen, especially if you're working with data-intensive systems, first thing investors are going to, going to want to know is, is this a science project or is this a product? Right? And a science project means, OK, the data doesn't exist for it, but I can envision a world where it does. Maybe I make it myself, maybe I don't, um, and it's going to take so long. That immediately is a red flag of don't invest in this company because they don't yet have what's necessary. But if you can think of a smaller product or a simpler product, something that you can take to market easily that will enable you to gather that data, then you're going to be in a really good position. Now, a lot of big companies, I think, are sitting, they think they're sitting pretty because they have a lot of data, right? Facebook has a lot of data. Amazon has a lot of data. So how do you build a machine learning system and be a disruptive startup when you're competing against terabytes and terabytes and terabytes of data? Well, consider this. Very little of the data they've gathered is anticipatory, meaning they were not thinking what products can then come out of this ecosystem if I create this data set. They're creating this data set, why? Because you should save everything. And then eventually you're going to find applications for it, right? Google was saving maps data. And then a driverless cars became one application of that. But that wasn't the initial motivation for saving that maps data. Amazon has a lot of data, but it's unclear what, what products that data is going to lead to. A lot of times, companies will even open up these data, these data sites, these data packages, things like that, to see what startups form in this ecosystem so that they can go and buy those startups. Because it's actually cheaper for them to go and purchase the startups than it is to build it in-house. And the reason that it's often cheaper isn't that the big companies lack intelligent people. It's what right now in the video game industry is called the innovator's dilemma, and that is, Okay, so 
most of you have heard of VR or seen some VR, virtual reality, maybe even tried one of those headsets, things like that, yes? Okay, so right now what's going on in the video game industry is you have some of the older players that may be doing $100 million a year in revenue that are saying, okay, I know I need to get onto VR. I know I need to do that in the same way that gaming companies like Zynga knew they had to get onto mobile. But here's the dilemma. I have shareholders. I've been showing them $100 million a year that I've been making. Do I devote resources on this new thing that's a bet and not make the $100 million next year, or do I continue business as usual? And so it's actually the inertia, the inertia and the comfort and the liking of how much revenue they're generating that prevents innovation in these larger companies. So they say, okay, I can't afford right now, given my shareholders, given existing concerns, I can't afford right now to develop these new technologies. At the same time, 10 years from now, I cannot afford to have not done those things. So that's the dilemma. And so a lot of companies will try to mitigate this dilemma by saying, okay, let's put some stuff out there, let's open source some tools, let's see what generates, what germinates in these ecosystems, and then maybe we can buy those startups when they're really small and they're about to take off. So now more and more companies are actually keeping startups independent. Even though they own them, they're keeping them as their independent entities so they can continue to have that very lean, very light sort of flow. One of the big decisions that we made was to take what we had and stop focusing so much on having our own night editor within our system, native formatting tools, stuff like that. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel and we don't want to be Microsoft Word and we don't want to be Google Docs. So one of the things we did quickly, and I encourage any of you that's developing a brand new technology, is to consider developing an API. Now, you may need to develop security around it so people don't simply use your output and train their own systems off of it, but this is a much cheaper way to develop a minimum viable product that you can take to market. It also helps you get, get validation from partners because partners will do a lot of that user testing. They'll get you a lot of that early usage, whereas you can focus on your core technology because I'll tell you that it's extremely difficult and it's extremely expensive to be refining a core technology at the same time that you're building out a sales engine. So one technique then is to say, okay, you guys can use our API. Google Docs, you can use our API. Anybody with a text editor, you can use our API. You can offer our service on your site. Get us lots of users. Get us lots of data. We focus on our product. We generate revenue through a third party. So this um, is a much more uh, dynamic model, and it's something that's catching on more in the education space as it did in the business space. Now for us, what we didn't see from the very beginning, but has become true and often becomes true when you take the time to build out your own core data set, is that there are a lot of applications. You actually stand to improve a lot of existing systems. So for us, doing this well in English enables us to go into other languages quite easily, because other languages are already supported by translation systems. So we can go into those we can do, Google, I don't know if any of you knows how Google Translate works, but they will take your language and they will often translate it into English first before translating it into another language. So if you're going from, say, Russian to Spanish, then they'll go from Russian to English to Spanish, even though they only show you the Spanish. And why do they do that? Because they have more training data between English and Russian than they do between Russian and Spanish. It's a very similar idea with us. We go with those translation systems and can open it up to other languages. There's also speech-to-text functionality, that those that are, we can build right on top of speech-to-text systems to say, is the, is the kind of speaking, are the words that you're using, the sentences you're using effective when you come up here in Guadalajara and give a speech to a lot of people? Or when you're giving a lecture in class, are there, is there feedback you can get on how you lecture? Are there ways to automatically organize notes from a meeting are there questions that the system can ask those that were speaking in a meeting so that they can clarify and refine their documents, their specification documents, their comments in their code, anything that's going to be writing in any context? 
So that for us is now our target. We're not just looking at, okay, you're submitting an essay in your class. We're looking at, are you writing a memo? Are you speaking with a colleague? Are you speaking in any context that matters to you? Are you on OkCupid、okay、looking for a date? Whatever it is, if it's writing and if it's in any human language, we care about it. So consider that when you think about, okay, this is going to be a real pain to develop my own data set. That is the most proprietary thing that you can have. Patents right now in algorithms are going away. People are far less interested in patents. Investors now barely ever ask whether you have any patents for your software, simply because you can tweak the algorithm a little bit, and now suddenly the patent doesn't cover it. So, what you ought to think about aren't, oh, I've got savvy new algorithms. Has any of you watched Silicon Valley? With their compression algorithm? Yeah, I would say move away from, I've got this great new method. Right? And as engineers, we're trained to think about the simplicity, the efficiency, and the elegance of methods. But think about is the data set right for my task? And if it's not, think about what it's going to take to build it. Ideally, and you're in a really sweet spot if you can build it through crowdsourcing or if you can build some functionality on your site that enables users to tell you enough that you can then build out the product that you want to. But I would say that a lot of these, particularly as startups going into machine learning, you need to think about how is my data going to grow over time? How is it going to give me a competitive advantage? How is it going to lead not only to this initial product that I want to build that's right for this small group of people, but how is that going to expand into a massive market over time? And how am I going to be able to, co to corner segment by segment? So, in a lot of ways, it's, a little, it's different from growing like your Uber. Right? It's not about let's get as much traction as quickly as possible. It's can I penetrate absolutely this market segment? Because if you do that in AI, you're gold. That's fantastic. It's so hard to completely penetrate a market segment in AI. But if you can do that in one category, other categories, and you can move on from there to build a really big and interesting company. So, what are the things that you could do this week? Um, how many of you are hacking this week? Okay, some of you are hacking this week. Well, there are some good tools that you can get right to work with if you want to try out some natural language processing systems, if you want to start playing around with AI.、Um, one that's really good and actually updates all the time is called Spacey. This is actually built by people that are both researchers and entrepreneurs. Most of the kits that are out there. Are either too much in research and they're too difficult to parse, or you have to do too much work to stabilize them or fix them in the code. But this is a really good system for getting started for any of you that, that knows Python or can use a Python wrapper. Then there's also Google Books and Grams, which is available, I think, in about 40 languages,、um, and that's available on AWS. So you can start playing with those right away and see what sorts of systems you might want to build.、Um, what you can do right away is start to How, how much is this just plug and play? Can I actually just use something that's open source and then generate something that's interesting? Then, if you can do that, and, and you're really lucky if you can just plug and play, then you need to think about what's going to stop somebody else from doing exactly what I'm doing. What is going to make this unique? Is it going to be methods or is it going to be data? So, I would say have hope. About this area. I think it's one of the biggest new areas. So far, the internet has been greatly about connecting people and having them do tasks that they would normally do via communication in a much simpler way. I think the next wave is going to be greatly about getting systems to take a lot of tasks off the table for us. But these are a little bit different to build, and you often need to have very strenuous tests in order to build these. But if you can build them, And it's proprietary to you, then you've got something really, really golden. Because there are very few companies, at least in Silicon Valley, that are using real science to build new products. Most of them are, we're developing a new photo app, but for schools, or they're trying to differentiate themselves by a market rather than by a technology. This is just the beginning, these are the baby steps of what I think will be a machine learning revolution. In the startup world and business generally, big companies are just figuring out how to play with some of these things. And whether it's language or it's optical recognition or it's video stuff, 
you will find very similar problems across your data domains. If you can find a way to even combine those different types of data, all the better for you, all the smarter that your system is going to be. I think I can now open it up for questions. Where's that box? Yes. Hi, Matthew. Uh, great talk, and thank you for the talk. I work at a company that, well, we have social media, and we usually get like complaints and suggestions and questions by uh, Facebook uh, inbox. So I'm wondering if there is uh, a company that has, automate, has made automatic the process of answering all of those comments. Uh, we currently have like uh, 400 comments per day and only two people answering them. So I, I think it would be good if we could like make it, make it automatic. Right, so the customer service, how do, you, how do you address all those customer service demands with an automated system. Now, some companies have emerged, but for very specific domains. And a lot of people are still in the mindset of, let me build an expert system. What you need to figure out is what percentage of the questions that you're getting are kind of general purpose questions and are at the lowest level of technicality. Because, and that's probably going to be the majority of them, right? And then you can start to look at, how do I limit the combinatorial space of this, right? Um, is it a limited vocabulary? Is it a limited set of n-grams, like I showed you? And then you can say, let me throw these things in my model, and I'll have it answer based on how you all have been answering these questions in the past. There's going to be some small segment of those questions that are going to be really difficult to automate, but it'll probably be so small of a percentage that it's fine with just people on your team answering those because it'll take up such a small amount of time. So I would say a good first step is going to be what is, what is the range of domains that you require to answer those questions? It's usually, it's usually like telephone and uh, address or stuff, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so stuff even like that. with stuff like that, you might even be able to plug in. So I'll tell you exactly how I would go about building this if I were here at a hackathon and we're trying this out. So I would say first thing you want to do is identify what sorts of topics are you dealing with, some range of them, because I'm going to want to build something to classify those different items by topic. Then I would employ something like n-grams as a language model, because you're going to want to check if the answer that you're giving is, is, uh, is uh, what's the right word, if it's fluent in the language that you're giving back. You don't want it to be just word slush. So that's what I would build at the, at the, as a second step to check it. First thing is classify it by topic. Second is what are a lot of the common ideas that you give as responses to those topics? And then I would, I would generate feedback from there. Yeah. Thank you. So if you decide to build something like that this weekend, you let me know, and I, I, I'll take a look at it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Close enough. Have you ever tested uh, the app for like most, the most famous authors, or have you ever um, like a publisher house tested? Yes, we have actually. So this is one of the use cases that emerged that we didn't really intend in classrooms was that teachers were actually using our system to teach literature. So what they would do is they would run a famous author through, and then sometimes our system would generate comments or suggestions or whatever. Because, you know, Hemingway and Shakespeare and Cervantes, they didn't have WriteLab to help them write. So 
So sometimes it would generate suggestions for them. And what the teachers would do is use it as an opportunity to show writing as choices. So they would say, okay, do you think, do you, would you accept this change or not? And if so, why? Why would you accept it? So then it gives them an opportunity to not just be standing before literature as an observer, as somebody inadequate to some monument of art, but as somebody that can tinker and somebody that can become authorial in the writing that they're looking at. Questions? Uh, thanks. I have a question. How do you create that algorithm to, I don't know, for example, if I'm writing a memo and I want to know, well, I want to translate this one into another language, but how does the machine know that I'm writing a memo or a letter or, I don't know, an essay? Because I've never heard of that before. I had that problem when I was, well, I was learning English and when I wanted to write something informal, they didn't catch up. So I have to, I don't know, go to another person that knows the language and it helps me. But how do you create that? So we have a general set that will translate this ineffective writing to more effective writing. And that's just based on what you would find if you looked at a book on effective business writing, effective legal writing, effective academic writing, and you took the overlap of all those texts that's what you'd find on our system. So there's that layer, which is the translation layer. Then there's another layer which says, what is it exactly that you're writing about? What are the idioms that are specific to the context in which you're writing? So what are the idioms that are specific to memo writing? Maybe there are certain phrases that people use. There's certain business lingo that people use, and there's a ton of that certainly in Silicon Valley. Then we can say, okay, we don't actually translate that segment because it's very common and people use that to express a certain idea. So that's actually all the customization we will do for a particular domain. Everything else is just general in the same way that, say, Google Translate would be. So in fact, you're going to use this like marks or phrases that I usually use in those kind of manners? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Somebody back there? Hi, uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm thinking about, is, is there going to be possible to create an algorithm that can measure the, like the persuasive aspect of a text? I'm thinking like related to copywriting sales letters, for example. Like they're, maybe they're not like the most complex texts, yeah. but they convey the message in a way that persuades uh, the customer to buy a product. And what are your views on those, uh, that issue? So one of the things that often disappoints students and some bloggers that we have that use us is that when it rewrites it, it actually shows that their original idea was quite empty. Or it, it simplifies it and shows that, oh, wait a second, I wasn't really saying much of anything. I was just using a lot of fluff words and things like that. Um, so then they need to add substance. We can't give them substance. But to help make them persuasive, we found that in order to parse text for logic, in order to turn it into premises, into prom propositions, into arguments, we first had to clarify those sentences. Because if we didn't know who agents, who agents were in the sentences, if we didn't know what the actions were in the sentences, then we didn't have subjects and predicates with which we could turn it into more logical writing. So by having that, we can then say, OK, there's actually some gaps here. There's some incoherence here. Um, we can't fill in those gaps for you, so we can't take something that you've written that's totally illogical and make it more logical, but we can clarify it to the extent that we can then ask you questions. We can then leave suggestions that you link ideas together a little bit better, and then you can make it more persuasive. I mean, for us, persuasion without logic is kind of unethical. So we're trying to drive the writing to be as logical as possible. Great, yep. thank you. Thank you. Um, what are the main differences between uh, your platforms and, and other platforms like Grammarly? Right. So, Grammar is 
as they treat it at least, is merely what are some of the dialectical uh, issues, some of those nuances, things like that. For us, we're looking at the core of the sentences. We're looking at the core of the paragraphs, what's actually going on, the relationship between ideas and the semantics, so that when we rewrite a sentence or we translate a sentence, we actually are starting from bare bones. We reassemble it. So unlike those systems which detect an, an error and then correct it, we build the sentence from scratch, and so we're actually always able to guarantee grammaticality in addition to the other things that we're trying to solve for, like illogical writing, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, a question that has in my mind some time in this um, talk is, uh, how sentient analysis is related to your work? How it's related to work? Did you say sentiment analysis? Hi. Uh, yes, sorry. How sentiment analysis is related to work? Well, a lot of systems, because sentiment analysis is quite binary, right? they can say, OK, this is positive or this is negative. Maybe they have a few more categories. Like if you look at Stanford system, they have like very positive, very negative, things like that. Um, a lot of easy systems have, have evolved, like uh, to look at reviews for Netflix, things like that, to try to make sorting a little bit easier. Outside of sorting, it's been quite difficult to use sentiment analysis. Outside of detection, so like in what we're trying to do, if you were to say, OK, we want you to rewrite this for, for us, but we also want it to just sound a little nicer, right? That's still quite a difficult task because just using, say, a nicer sounding synonym doesn't always work for the context. So what really needs to happen are systems specifically for generating text that emerge in the sentiment analysis ecosystem. Um, and, you know, I think that that's... That's a great task for somebody that wants to build an API because then they can license it to IBM. They can license it to all the companies that are already using sentiment analysis, but in some very mediocre way. And that's kind of a shot at IBM too. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, did you ever thought about this exa exact uh, product that you're making, but making to the art field, like music composition or sculpting and stuff like that, that can help the one to be or the students of art to improve their work and become a, a better artist? So that's exactly the kind of thing that I was talking about with taking machine translation into other domains. So if you had, say, okay, here's all the, there's this huge body of first-year art students. Here's what they produce. Now, here's this huge body of fourth-year, fifth-year, or maybe professional artists. Now, I have these two bodies of data. What are the operations that require going from here to here, right? The system can infer what these things are, right? This is called an alignment model. It'll actually align. This thing becomes this other thing. Okay, now you have a sense of what are the core pathways that this student needs to go down in order to learn those skills? Because they may have different strengths and different weaknesses. So in order to really personalize learning in those kinds of domains, you mentioned art, you mentioned sculpting, I've thought about it with respect to dance, that you actually need to know where they are. You start where the students are able, but you can only really do that if you know what path they need to follow in order to go to what state you need them to be at. So I absolutely think that's possible. And I think that's where we need a lot of young developers to just get on these things. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Thanks, uh, and a great speech. Um, as a students, where, uh, where can we start to learn about machine learning? Because it's a new area in a, in a kind of way, but as students, we don't know where to start or where can we find information to know about. Right. 
Okay, so if you want to work with, start learning about machine, generally, uh, machine learning generally, like say for images or for sound or whatever it is you want to classify, I highly recommend a, a toolkit called Scikit-Learn. Um, it is, it's written in Python, and you can just go and you can just use their examples and their toy data sets. It's very difficult um, outside of some kind of programming context to start playing with machine learning, just because it gets so conceptual and theoretical. But if you start there, you can build something in a day. If you want to work specifically with language, then I would recommend what I had showed, which was uh, called spacey.io. And you can immediately start playing around with models. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, uh, great speech, great talk, thank you. So uh, this is uh, a question not completely related to, um, to uh, interference. Artificial intelligence, but I, I would like to know your take on singularity. How do you envision when when we can have uh, a sufficient enough general in artificial intelligence that it can it can improve itself? So where we are right now is that it's so hard to build these systems. It's actually, and then the more complex or interesting a problem that you want to undertake, the more ridiculously difficult, right? So like, say you want to build a really good machine product in medicine. There's so many variables that you're going to have to account for. It's going to be almost impossible for any one person to build a data set to really meet the needs of that product. You're going to need to, do, you're going to, need to have some other strategy. So I think if that were to happen, we're a long way from it. I think also you have to consider what sorts of, along this pathway where you have lots of individual products that are building these uh, intelligent systems, if they were to connect with each other and we were to find a way for them to speak meaningfully to each other, what sorts of ways would we want to regulate their behavior, right? Because we have to program all of the intelligence. Now, it learns from itself recursively, but we can weigh in on that recursion. So I think it becomes kind of like the uh, pollution problem, right? Like how do you avoid greater and greater pollution. Oh, we're having more and more cars and we're doing more and more stuff. That's a question of, if we can see this trajectory from here, where do we need to regulate to avoid such a thing, to keep such a thing from happening? And I'm not so worried about like the Terminator Skynet scenario of all the defense systems talking to each other. I'm more concerned about monopolistic companies that have too much control with a lot of unintended consequences of particular intelligent systems, right? Privacy violations, all of that kind of stuff. And I think that's just where regulation needs to come in. Nice, thank you. Yep. Over here. Hi, have you ever tried or thought about combining this technology with um, the EPUB? from emotive inside that reads your frequencies, your brain frequencies, uh, about, I don't know, concentration and that kind of stuff from learning that can improve the, the right lab. I'm sorry, could you repeat? I, I, I can't hear you that well. Sorry. Um, have you tried or thought about combining this technology with the um, EPOC that reads your frequency from your brain about concentration and learning to improve your reading No, skills. no, 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 I haven't. So this is actually connecting to your brain. And what does it do? Does it look, is it trying to assess what? Um, try, no. it, try to learn uh, all your um, frequencies like alpha, beta, theta, uh -huh. and uh, try to think if you are okay with this, if you think, uh, I don't know, I want to this ball, digital ball, uh, move, and you can move that ball, you can learn about yourself, uh, about your status, about your feelings, and maybe I was thinking like uh, you have an A and A. Level concentration with this, and you can maybe try to write something, and maybe you can think if you are okay with that, you are not okay with that, you are uh, having something fun. That would be fascinating for training. 
right? Yeah. If, if, some, if that ever caught on to the extent that enough people were using it, then I think lots of companies would want to train off of that kind of data. Um, if it's too few of people, even if it's a really good signal, but the amount of data is too low, then we wouldn't be able to do that much with it. So it really depends on how much that's penetrated. I've also seen other products with headsets where you can go from one language to another and have a conversation with somebody that doesn't speak your language and have a pretty much fluent conversation. Those kinds of technologies also would hook up very well to this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. We have, thank you all for your attention and time. I wish you the best of luck the rest of this week. Thank you.